Hey, uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you guys would, would say you believe in miracles? Raise your hand. Let me see. Oh, awesome. Like the whole room is up. That's, that's, a, that's incredible. For those of you who are still in limbo, listen, truly, my, my prayer is that by the end of this, you would look at them in a different perspective. Because here's the, here's the thing that I, I feel like we run into, the problem that we run into from time to time, is this word miracles has been watered down and stripped of its power worse than the U.S. dollar. You know what I mean? Like, for example, you might say, or maybe you've heard people say sometimes, like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I filled up my gas tank for under $100. It's a miracle. It's like, hmm, that's not really a miracle. We just got used to living in inflation and just, like, poor political decisions, right? Like, it's not a miracle. Or, oh, my gosh, you, you wouldn't believe it. I actually made it to work on time. It's a miracle. Mm, I don't know. Praise the Lord. I made it to work on time. Nah, I don't know if that's a miracle. You just decided to stop living on Hispanic time. You know, it's just changed your life in a certain way. And listen, I live most of my life like that. It's how I grew up. And so all things are possible through Jesus Christ. That's all, that's all I'm saying. But the reality is, is that a true miracle is when our all-knowing, all, all power, forever present God intervenes in our life. A lot of the times it can't be predicted, most of the time can't be explained, but it is always 100% for his glory. All throughout scripture, you see people who were like in the most hopeless situations, ready to give up, and then one encounter with God, one divine intervention, and it changed everything forever. And you read scripture and most of the miracles that you see, they fall into at least one of four categories. There's healing, deliverance, provision, and protection. So what I want to do today is I want to unpack the miracle of healing. Healing is one of those things where you see Jesus himself in the New Testament heal at least 30 different people 30 different times. He literally, he, he opened blind eyes. He made the, the deaf hear. He made the lame walk. He raised people from the dead. And you know one of the most amazing things about the miracle power of healing? He made it available to us today. John 14, 12. This is... Jesus speaking to us, and he's like, I'm telling you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I've done, and even greater works, because I'm going to go be with the Father. All throughout the Bible, you see people healing in the name of Jesus. And I think for me, one of the most impactful, because it's also funny, the, the context and the scenario of it, happens to be in Acts chapter 20. And just so that you know, this is the Apostle Paul, and he is in basically a house church, a big community group, and he's, he's preaching. And we see this pretty uh, particular in, peculiar instance in verse 9. It says, look, Paul spoke on and on. Like he was about to leave the next day, so he had a lot to say. And a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep, dropped three stories to his death. Like, look, I know I've made some of you doze off, right? Like, wake up. I, I get it, but I've never killed anyone, so, like, I think I'm doing pretty good. So Paul, he's like, I got a lot to say in a short amount of time to do it because I'm leaving. And it says he's literally preaching on and on. And this young dude is up in the window. I don't know why he's up there. It probably just it's hot or whatever. And he's literally, like, dozing off and then... Boom, he falls three stories, dies. Paul runs down there, raises him back from the dead. And then in verse 10, he, 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 everybody's freaking out. Obviously, they probably heard the loud thump. And he's like, don't be alarmed. Don't worry. He's alive. And then he went upstairs, broke bread after he ate. And then he kept talking until daylight. And then he left. Like, Paul's a savage. You know, you would think after someone almost dies or actually dies, you'd be like, all right, I'm done on that note. Let's call it a night. But he's like, no, I got a word from God, and I'm going to keep preaching till the sun comes up. So for those of you who are like, man, his 35-minute messages are really long. Realize it could be a lot worse, all right? But this is an amazing situation where you see God's miracle power of healing raise this young man from the dead. He was dead through Paul. Because remember what Jesus says, he gave us that power, John 14, 12. Anyone who believes in me 
will do the same works that I've done and even greater works. We serve a God that makes all things possible. A God who can do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we ask, think, or imagine. A God who's given us the miracle power of healing. Come on, do you believe it? Like you have it in you. Maybe you're hearing it for the first time, and I hope that it encourages you because you're already thinking about the healing that needs to happen in your life or in the life of people that you love and that you care about. You have God's miracle healing power inside of you. How many of you would say, I need some healing in my life, or I know someone who does? Would you raise your hand? Okay, well, you came to the right place because today I believe with all the faith that I have, we're going to have the opportunity to come before God with faith and boldness and believe that healing will begin in this place. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in and through my life. And I know that a lot of you guys have too. But what do you do in situations where you've prayed and you've believed and and you've expected and yet the, the results didn't really line up to what your expectations were leading you to believe? How do you manage that tension? So what I want to do is I want to talk about two crucial components of a miracle. That, there's, there's a lot more, but I want to focus on these two that I really think will bring some biblical explanations as to why sometimes we don't see the results that we think, that we hope for. Uh, and at the same time, it's not just explaining these things, but I, I'm praying that it will actually build our faith and our belief for more, and believe that we can continue to pray for healing even if we don't see it in the moment exactly the way that we think that it should happen. And the first component that's really important for us to understand is is God's will. See, God's will is absolutely foundational for our life and our faith. Like, the acknowledgement of God's will, the acknowledgement of the priority is, is so important. It's without acknowledging the priority of God's will in our life that it reigns supreme over ours, it's almost impossible to deal with frustration and difficulty and, and heartbreak and still believe for more and still have faith for more. And notice, though, I said an acknowledgement of its priority, not an understanding of it. If you try to understand God's will, you drive yourself crazy. A lot of the times it's humanly impossible to understand God's will. And here's why. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, this is God saying, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. See, God is saying, I don't think the way you think. I don't do things the way you do them. Like, the distance between you and I is actually greater than the distance between heaven and earth. It's immeasurable. You can't measure it. I do things differently. So what it comes down to is you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to trust that there's so much more happening in the moment. My plan is so much bigger than you feel and see in the moment And I'm working, and if to acknowledge it in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the frustration, in the middle of the heartache, to see there's something bigger going on. i got to trust him. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. And you see Jesus actually living this out, even when his life depended on it. Hours before he would be illegally arrested, tortured, and executed, he gets away with a few of his disciples to pray because he knew, like, I'm going to need God's strength for what I'm about to go through. And so in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, he says in this really intimate, quiet moment, alone with God, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And notice he doesn't say, God, if you're able to do this, would you do it? Because he knew that God could do anything. He said, no, no, no. If you're willing, it's about your will, not mine. It's not about my ability or, or your ability. It's about your will. And the temptation could be for us to sit here, because I do this sometimes too, and I'm like, well, that's easy for him to say. He is God. Yeah, he is 100% God, but he's also 100% human. And I believe that what you see in this passage is his humanity crying out. He's like, Dad, please, 
I don't want to do this. It's going to hurt so bad. But if there's no other way, then okay, I trust you. That's so powerful. And then just a few moments later, the gang comes to arrest Jesus. And Peter, who's one of his best friends, he had three best friends, Peter, James, and John. Peter, impulsive Peter, like they're coming to arrest him. He pulls out a sword, chops one of the guy's ears off. And then Jesus in verse 51, he says, hey, no more of this, enough. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. And then Matthew 26, verses 53 to 54, it says that Jesus, he turns to Peter and he says, don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he'd send them instantly. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? How could he have, he went from the perspective of like, I don't want to do this. And moments later saying, what are you doing? Don't you understand that it's bigger than us? That is a spiritual acknowledgement, submission to a will that's greater than his. How the scriptures would be fulfilled that describe must happen now. Even when his life depended on it. Jesus acknowledged the priority of of God's will in his life, and it allowed him to be able to push through physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual anguish like you wouldn't believe, and still have faith for the bigger picture. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Listen, you need to know that just because God's will for your life might not be complete healing right now, it doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It doesn't mean he doesn't care about you. God loves you so much. Don't think for one moment that your hurt, your pain, your frustration, it doesn't hurt God. He's our perfect loving father and he loves you more than anything. He just knows the whole story. He knows what you can handle through him. That's the key. You can't do it on, a lot of people are like, oh, God will never give you anything more than you can handle. You know what? I can prove to you that he will. He will give you more than you can handle, but through him, there's nothing you can't handle. And when you acknowledge that will, your faith begins to rise up. Peter is is encouraging the the early church, Christians who are being tormented beyond anything that you can even imagine. It's not like, oh, someone bashed me online because I posted a Jesus picture or I support Israel or whatever. Oh, I'm, I'm so sad. They're being killed. They're being persecuted, martyred for their faith. And listen to what he says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, you need to understand this. The suffering will end. The pain will stop. I can't tell you when, I can't tell you how, but I believe with all my heart that it will. It can and it will at some point. This side of heaven or on the other side of it, but it will stop. And when it does, he will restore you and support you and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. It sounds like Peter grew a little bit from when he like chopped that guy's ear off, right? But that's what God can do in a person when they humble themselves and they just say, God, do a work in me that I can't do myself. He went from taking things into his own hands to saying, hey, Take a step back. We're all suffering. We're all struggling. And at one point, God's going to come through because he's faithful. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. One of the most powerful prayers that you can pray when you're desperate for healing, when you're desperate for a miracle, is, Lord, your will be done. And the secret to actually be able to pray that prayer and mean it so that it's not lip service. It's not just some routine thing you memorize and say, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you're like, do you know what that means? Do you know what you're actually declaring? It means 
his will, his ways, his thoughts over yours all the time. That's humanly impossible, so you need to be able to do it supernaturally. And the secret to be able to do that and actually mean it is faith. Like it's our, it's our faith. God's will, our faith. Our faith is a crucial part of any miracle, but especially the miracle of healing. And you see three examples of this in the New Testament. I'm going to walk through them. And Mark chapter 5 is the first one. It's the, the woman, she's known as the woman with the issue of, of blood. So she has been bleeding for 12 years. She's considered culturally unclean. She's in pain. She's frustrated. And she's in a situation where she, she, she sees Jesus walking towards her. And she's like, man, if I could just touch Jesus, I'll be healed. And so Jesus is coming towards her. And with all her faith, she just reaches out and, and grabs his clothes and as he's walking by, he's like, what was that? Because he felt power leave from him. And he's looking at her, and she's like, I, I just believe. And so he looks down at her, and he says, daughter, that word alone, a cultural, societal outcast who's hurting. And he looks at her, and he says, no, 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 you're my daughter, they reject you, but I accept you. I love you. Daughter, your faith has healed you. And later in chapter 10, there's this blind man. And he's like, Jesus, I, I can't see you, but I know you're there. How many times have you been in that situation where you're like, God, I can't see you, but I know you're there. That's faith. And he looks at the guy and he says, Go. Your faith has healed you. Luke chapter 17, a man with leprosy, another social outcast, just like the woman. No one will touch him. No one will go near him. He's in physical pain and anguish. And he gets into Jesus' presence and he falls down and he's worshiping Jesus at his feet. It's a declaration of his faith. Because what you bow your knee to is what you worship. What you have faith in. And so he's on the floor worshiping Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and he says, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. See, our faith can actually move the hand of God. And I know faith can be a little bit of a subjective word. Oh, I have faith. And it could be a, one of those things where it's like, I don't know exactly what that means. So just so that we're on the same page for the rest of our time, we're going to define faith as the complete trust in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. It's the complete trust in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. When we have faith, complete trust, like trust fall kind of faith, Tithe, even when it doesn't make sense, kind of faith. Serve, love, forgive, believe, even when it doesn't make sense. Complete trust in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. It releases his miraculous power. See, our faith can either be the catalyst to miracles or the barrier. And we actually see both of those situations, both of the extremes in scripture, Luke chapter 7, the story of a centurion. So he's basically a Roman soldier who's uh, in charge of 100 men. And he has this servant, this guy that works for him, and he loves this guy. And he's sick and he's dying. And he says, go find Jesus. Bring Jesus here. Because Jesus changes everything. He can bring hope. He can heal. Bring him here. And then somewhere along the line, he's like, bring him here? I'm summoning Jesus? What the heck is wrong with me? You know what? Never mind. I don't deserve for him to be in my house. I don't deserve to be in his presence. You just tell Jesus to say the word, and I know that he'll be healed. Just say the word. And then in verse 9, 
It says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith in Israel. That's a profound statement. A Roman who's supposed to hate him, respects him, reveres him, worships him. His people who are supposed to recognize him as the Messiah and worship him and put him on a pedestal don't have that kind of faith. I have not even seen that faith in Israel. And the servant was healed. See, our faith can either be a catalyst to miracles and to healing or it could be a barrier. Jesus is traveling around. He's performing miracles. There's all this buzz around Jesus, and he, and he comes back home. And in Matthew chapter 13, you see this, the context is that his own people, like, they're not impressed. They hear all the buzz and everything that's going on, and they're like, Jesus? The, the son of the carpenter, the virgin son, that guy. The, the little smart aleck that had all the answers in class. That dude? I don't think so. And then in verse 58, it says he didn't do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. See, a lack of faith can be a miracle killer. That's why it's so important to just be aware and not be so caught in the, the hustle of life that you don't check where your level of faith is. Like, ask yourself, do you have this say the word and it'll be done kind of faith? Or is it a, huh, 50-50, you know? Sometimes I pray I get the parking spot, sometimes I don't. I don't know. Like, be honest with yourself. Like, if I'm, if I'm being honest, I'll check my faith from time to time and I'm like, ugh. It's lower than I thought. Ugh, and it's like a punch to my gut. You're probably like, oh, you're a pastor. What the heck? Low faith? How does that happen? Yeah, I'm also human. It doesn't matter where you come from, how many times you've seen God move in your life, who you are, what your calling is. We all go through these deep, dark seasons where our faith is low, it's lacking. We all do. I've been in those seasons where I'm like, God, where are you? Why am I still struggling with this? Why am I not healed yet? Why aren't they healed? Why are they still bound? Where are you? And it's like in that moment, I feel my faith just drop. And it's okay. Don't let it continue to drop. It's in those moments where you can raise it back up. And I want to tell you two things that I try my best to do when I feel that, and I hope that it will help you. They're faith boosters. And the first one is to ask God. Just ask him. Isn't it awesome how amazingly simple God makes it for us sometimes? It's almost like he wants us to succeed. You could ask him. We see the story in Mark chapter 9. It's his dad, and he's struggling because his, his son is really sick. They tried everything. And so they believe, and so they're, they go to ask Jesus but he doesn't want to get his hopes up. And so in verse 22, he says, have mercy on us and help us if you can. And Jesus is like, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cries out something that I've said a lot. And maybe you can relate to it too. And he says, I do believe. But would you help me overcome my unbelief? And then Jesus sees the sincerity of his faith and he heals his son. If you're in a place where you know you need a miracle, you need to be healed, someone you love needs to be healed, and you're like, man, I I don't think I have the say the word kind of faith and it'll be done. Ask him. 
He's faithful to his word. Ask him for more faith. He will meet you right where you're at and he will give you the faith that is required. But you keep asking, you keep seeking, you keep praying. Lord, I need the faith. It's, faith isn't just this thing you muster up. It's supernatural. It's given to you. Ask him for it. And the other thing that I do is I remember the empty tomb. When I look at my situations and I'm like, ugh, it just feels impossible. How is this? How can I continue like this? I, I, I remember the empty tomb because what you need to understand, if you're not a Christian or you're new to, to the faith, is that the strength of our faith lies in the empty tomb. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. See, Satan knew that Jesus is the hope of the world and that faith in him and belief in him would not only bring healing to our bodies, but new life to our soul. And so he's like, hey, once and for all, what we gotta do is we gotta put an end to God's plan for humanity, for salvation, for healing, for hope. And so he concentrated all of hell's power on Jesus on that cross. But guess what? On the third day, he rose again, and he walked out of that tomb. And we have that same empty tomb power living inside of us. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, he lives in you. He gives us that resurrection empty tomb power. Listen to me. You might feel overwhelmed and being crushed beyond anything that you've ever felt. You think you might not make it. God is still with you. The tomb is still empty, the devil remains defeated, and he has given us this miracle power to heal and see lives changed. So let your faith rise up and believe with every ounce that you have for more that you will see God move in your life. Would you do me a favor? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment? The most important place to start when you're looking for a miracle is Realizing that it comes from a relationship with him. Salvation is the greatest miracle that, you will, that we will ever have access to. And the amazing thing is, is that it's free. It came at a price, but it's free to us. And one of the things that prevents God from moving is, is, is sin in our lives. Having a separation between us and him. And he sent Jesus to bridge that gap. You can genuinely say, Lord, forgive me of my sins and I want to follow you. Redeem me, repair me. And he's faithful to his word and, and, and he will do it. The only thing that's required is for you to be in a genuine, authentic relationship with him. That he is your father, he is your Lord, he is your savior. And you're not perfect, you'll mess up. We all mess up all the time, but there's grace and there's mercy, there's forgiveness. He just wants your heart. And every time you fall, he'll be right there to pick you back up again. If you're in this place today and, and you, you can't say for a fact that you have submitted your life to Jesus, that you are a follower of Jesus, that when you die, you will go to heaven, that you have the spirit of the living God inside of you, this is your moment. Forget about what you're praying for. Your salvation trumps all of that. We'll get to the prayers after. But if you're in here today and you're tired of living life your own way, you're tired of not even knowing, not even knowing if you're in a relationship with God or not, it would be my honor to pray a prayer with you, to lead you in a prayer that actually solidifies that relationship once and for all. You don't need to keep praying it every time you mess up. I've been there every Sunday, pray it again. I messed up again. It doesn't work like that. When you enter it freely, willingly, understanding what it is, you just ask for forgiveness. You're already his. So if you're in here today and you're ready to say, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus. I want my sins forgiven. 
Would you do me a favor? Would you raise your hand? I just want to see who I'm praying for. Everyone's heads bowed, their eyes are closed. I just want to know. I see your hands. There's a couple up there. Okay, go ahead and put them down. The only reason I asked is because I want to know who I'm praying for. This is between you and God. So if you didn't raise your hand, you can still pray this prayer, and it's just as impactful. But everybody in this place, repeat after me. Just pray this out loud and strong together, whether you're praying it for yourself or you've already prayed it because we're supporting each other in this. Say, Jesus, I believe you're God. I believe that you died and rose again so that I could be forgiven and have a new life. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit so that I can know you, love you, and serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, how many of you would say in this place today that you believe in miracles? Come on, make some noise. Do me a favor. Would you stand to your feet right now? This is what I want to do. We're going to put that faith into action with everything that we have. And we're going to come before God and we're going to believe that miracles are going to flow in this place today. Right here right now. If you need physical healing in your body, emotional healing, there's a wound from a relationship or love that you never felt and, and it's dividing you from even how you see God or letting other people in. You've been betrayed. There's, just, there's something inside of you and you're struggling with it. Maybe it's a supernatural thing, like there's a spiritual war inside of you and you're like, you need help. What I want to ask is for you to be bold and come forward so that the team can pray for you and believe together for healing. Even if you don't want to come forward, I would encourage you because I think that there's something very powerful to putting a physical action to it. But even if you don't, you can pray right where you're at and believe. Believe right where you're at that his spirit is moving in this place. We're going to lift up our voices. We're going to pray. We're going to believe. And if maybe you're in a season in life where you're like, you know what, I'm good. I want everybody in this place right now and online, if you're watching, join in and praying for the requests of your brother and sisters that are going up to God right now. Nobody shouldn't be worshiping and shouldn't be praying. Everyone should be worshiping. Everybody should be praying, believing that the Spirit of God is moving in this place because he's close to the brokenhearted. The Bible says that when two or three gather together, he is in their midst. We're going to declare some healing in Jesus' name in this place. Because when you declare it in Jesus' name, chains have to break. Fear has to bow. Walls have to come down. Lives have to be healed. Hope has to come. Come on, believe it. Declare it together.